Five Mongolian envoys knelt on the Kamakura beach and craned their necks at the absence of pain. They gazed at the deep blue of the Pacific Ocean, with the waves breaking slowly. How they wished their last sight was of an ocean of grass gently swaying in the steppe breeze. Their hearts were calm as the waves lapped against their bare necks. They were going to take revenge. It was with this execution of ambassadors that Hojo Tokumun, the Shirken, head of the shogun government and ruler of Japan, gave his final response to Kubilai Khan, Emperor of China, Son of Heaven and Earth. Of China, Son of Heaven, Great Khan of the Mongols. He will not submit. Not now. Not ever. The shining peak of Mount Fuji towers over the headless Mongolian warriors. Soon after, Kubilai sent five more men. This time there would be no negotiations. They came to announce something. An invasion. It would be the greatest maritime attack the world had ever seen. The new envoys met the same end, but they did not have the honor of dying in the beneficent shadow of Mount Fuji. In the beneficial shadow of Mount Fuji. His blood stained the western beaches where his compatriots had tried to land on Kyushu. A year before. The first invasion had taken place in November 1274. Large Korean ships, decked out in Mongolian costume and crowned with grotesque figureheads, invaded the island of Kyushu in November 1274. The surviving Japanese islanders of the outlying domains of Tsushima and Iki were pinned, screaming horribly, to the ships. They were nailed, screaming horribly, to the prows of the ships. The armada, stretching to the horizon, darkened the waters and docked in Hakata Bay. In northern Kyushu, closed ranks of soldiers descended from the ships into the water and marched in formation. Shields high, to the beach. The defending samurai were not familiar with this phalanx warfare. They didn't know what to say. When should they shout their challenge? Whom? How could they know if their opponents had the proper range? One of the defenders made up his mind, raised his great bow and took aim at a mounted officer, and fly away. Hojo Tokumun, unsure of himself since his recent tenure, presiding over a kingdom plagued with misfortune, lay on the lap of his concubine who stroked his long hair. He was the president of a kingdom plagued with misfortune, and he lay on the lap of his concubine, who stroked his long hair. His kingdom was ancient, though the Tokumun were only warriors from the interior who had recently become usurpers of the crown. They had recently become usurpers of the strings of national power. He was thinking mostly of the Mongol threat, the first large-scale invasions his country had ever known. For the first time in his young life, he wondered how Japan had come to be like this. Tokumun fell into a light sleep. He dreamed slowly, vividly, fitfully of a Japan, not as it was today, but as it had been, in the mists of old. But as he had been, in the mists of a forgotten time. The Beginnings Regretting the errors made in the ancient texts and wishing to correct the inaccuracies in the old chronicles, Her Highness the reigning Empress Genmei, on the eighteenth day of the ninth moon of the fourth year of the Wado era, decided to establish a new information management system. Wado's fourth year moon, November 3rd, 711, commanded me, Yasumaro, to select and record the ancient words, and conscientiously raise them before her. I, Yasumaro, in true trembling and fear, bow my head, bow my head. Court noble, Fudo no Yasumaro, upper division, first class, fifth rank, fifth order of merit. He paused in his writing, moved his knees slightly to make his kneeling position a little more comfortable, dipped his fine brush in black ink, and began his great work. The great project of him. A work that would last forever. Yasumaro continued to make the dimly understood fables, legends, and myths of antiquity. As facts. He created a divine fable to legitimize and divinize the power of his very human imperial masters and the right of his people to freedom of expression. And the right of his people, the Yamato, 
to dominate all other tribes and peoples on the land we know today as Yamato. He described how Izanagi was able to dominate all the other tribes and peoples on the land we know today as Japan. He described how Izanagi and Izanami created the islands, mountains, rivers, grasses, etc. and trees with drops of water from a coral spear. They then begot the Lord of the Universe, the Sun Goddess Amaterasu, the eldest of her divine children. Divine Children She sent her grandson, Ninaji no Mikoto, to Earth as the first ruler of the land. But it was not only Ninji who came down to Earth, the father of Hisusanoo, the god of storms. Rude and cheeky, he was banished from heaven for his dirty and evil behavior. While the people of Susanoo conquered and prospered in Izumo, in the west of the island of Honshu, the people of Ninji also prospered and multiplied in the south. In three generations, they had grown powerful enough to push north into central Honshu, engaging their enemies to establish a new power base. Her names were countless, but most people know her as Yamatai. Yamatai was ruled by an emperor, Jimu the first in a line that was to last forever. Of course, things were probably not as Yasumaro had told them. For Yasumaro to serve a deity, the imperial line had to have divine blood. Thus, Yasumaro wove the countless myths of the Yamato people into a solid story. In doing so, he'd discovered a royal lineage going back to the sun itself. The Amaterasu in his story was probably based on the legendary 3rd century great shaman, Queen Himiko. Himiko, legendary shaman from the 3rd century. Susanoo, too, hers her brother, and her fight with her, may have represented a real disagreement. Much like a heavenly battle. It was a piece of propaganda, similar to the Roman Aeneid, mixing dimly remembered myths heroic legends, and war stories. The Aeneid was a mixture of dimly remembered myths, heroic legends, and cheeky fabrications to legitimize Augustus's reign. Caesar in Rome, or the secret history of the Mongols, which he did the same with Genghis Khan. However, the first settlers of Japan arrived in a much more humane way. They first crossed land bridges from the Asian continent tens of thousands of years earlier and they continued to arrive in small groups from all directions for centuries. The population was small, perhaps 160,000 at its peak, so these people, called Jaman, from the rope drawings they left on their pottery, would have lived by hunting and gathering the abundant resources they found around them. They did not know war, until a new people began to arrive. It was this town whose myths Yasamaro wrote. The many-encircled palace of the storm god was copied on all the islands by a new, ambitious and greedy people, who coveted the land and the land itself. Archaeological and genetic data show that a large part of the Japanese of the Yayoi period, from the north, from Siberia, Mongolia and Manchuria, from the Korean peninsula and from the other side of the sea, from the Korean peninsula and across the seas. Some modern research also suggests material and cultural similarities with civilizations in Java and other parts of the southeast. There is no doubt that there are similarities with the civilizations of Java and other parts of Southeast Asia. What is certain is that the Yayo peoples were not the last humans in pre-Japanese history to immigrate to the Japanese islands. To emigrate to the Japanese islands. In the first centuries of the Common Era, a period of unrest and warfare on the mainland, a massive wave of people came to settle the Japanese islands. A massive wave of people poured in from northern China, bringing with them material wealth and knowledge that improved virtually every aspect of human life on the islands. Some of them became nobles, recorded their names and entered the chronicles. There are still names and surnames linking present-day Japan to these ancient settlers today, but the exact details of Japan's beginnings are arguably lost in the mists of time, both linguistically and culturally. The exact details of Japan's beginnings are lost in the mists of time, both linguistically and culturally. 
So the mystery remains, who are the Japanese? The Shaman Queen 297 AD. Before that, the country was ruled by one man. For 70 or 80 years there were problems and wars. So the people agreed to elect a woman as their ruler. Her name was Himiko. She was engaged in magic and sorcery, bewitching the town. She had a younger brother who helped her run the country. After she became ruler, few people saw her. She had a thousand women as servants, but only one man. She lived in a palace surrounded by towers and palisades, with armed guards on constant watch. When Himiko died, she erected for herself a great mound more than a hundred paces in diameter, and more than a hundred men and women followed her to her grave. Kofun. 162,000 of these burial mounds have been identified throughout Japan. They vary in shape and size, but the classic coffin is shaped like a keyhole or bell. The longest measures more than 400 meters. The burial chambers are made of stone. Those that had not been looted were found decorated with paintings depicting life at court and filled with useful accessories for the afterlife. The prehistoric and semi-legendary period recounted in the Chinese classic Sanguji, History of the Three Kingdoms, was marked by the presence of large numbers of men and women. Of the Three Kingdoms, recounts not only the enthronement of Queen Himiko, the spell she casts to pacify the kingdom and the influx of people from across the seas. She has seen the advent of these huge megalithic engineering projects. Despite her white mulberry fiber dress, the heat of the night, and the burning torches, a chill of pure ice tore at the girl's heart at the sight of the mound that would be her resting place. Rest. But she pulled herself together, the Magatama charms that adorned her body jingling as she danced towards her destiny as a heavenly woman. Her as she danced towards her destiny as a heavenly lady awaiting her late lady, ruler of. Of Yamatai, Queen of Wa, friend of the Chinese Wei dynasty. Himiko. Despite her fears and doubts, her heart brimmed with pride at the thought of fulfilling this duty. This duty. There would never be another like the late queen of hers. Himiko had put a spell on Yamatai, using Kido magic. Sorcery had brought peace where there had been war, prosperity where there had not been. There weren't any. The people loved her, but no one could lay eyes on her. Even the thousand girls who served her ignored her face. Not even the thousand girls who served her knew her face. The queen only allowed one person in her presence, her brother. This man served her food and wine, and communicated the laws and sentences to her flock. Himiko's most amazing achievement had been sending four diplomatic missions to faraway China with gifts of slaves. Far away China with slave gifts and the fine, strong fabrics for which the Queen's country was justly famous. For which the Queen's country was justly famous. In return, treasures like never before seen. Pearls, bronze mirrors and, above all, swords, military banners and an official seal that declared her friend. Her official seal declaring her friend and ally of the Wei dynasty. Himiko and her top envoys were symbolically named members of the highest ranks of the Chinese Wei Army. China Her magic spread across the oceans and she bewitched the Chinese sovereign, who bestowed her highest honor on her. The greatest honor of all. With China's recognition, everyone bowed to her, and Yamatai dominated the Japanese islands. Japanese Islands but, as always happens, the great queen breathed her last from her and the people of Yamatai. He raised a large mound, a coffin, over her grave. One hundred young men and women were chosen to serve her until the end of time. The girl shivering in the heat of the summer night was one of them. She danced through the crackling flames to the coffin's mound, and to, eternal life after death. Eternal. Himiko and her servants are supposed to enjoy eternal peace in Hashihaka's coffin. 
Murders and massacres followed, more than a thousand people were killed. 1537. A relative of Himiko's named Io, a thirteen-year-old girl, was then made queen and order was restored. Zhang, Zheng, an ambassador from Wei, issued a proclamation stating that Io was the sovereign. The ruler. This gave rise to a model in Japan. Throughout antiquity, the status of women was high, and female monarchs appear repeatedly in chronicles. The Chronicles Some, like Empress Jingu, beat the drums of war, others seem to have followed in the footsteps of Himiko and Io to promote a country at peace. Io to promote a country at peace with itself, 